Welcome everyone. I hope you have a great conference so far. So as Simona correctly said, we are going to take a look at Angular libraries today. And so I would like to immediately start with the question why. Why do we actually want to build libraries? Well, actually it's quite intuitive. I mean, when you build your application, you don't want to replicate the same stuff over and over again, but you rather want to reuse other parts, right? Whether that's reusing parts from the open source world or even just to change them within your own company. And so we don't just want to actually give a look or foster a lot of libraries, but we want to have a look at the healthy ecosystem so that we have good quality libraries. And so who am I? My name is Juri Stromflaner. I'm a Google developer expert in web technologies, specifically Angular. I'm coming from South Tyrol, Italy, which is in the middle of the Alps, so lots of snow right there. Right there. And I'm currently working at a company called R3GIS. We do GIS and web de development on mobile and on desktop. I'm also a trainer and consultant, and I do publish videos for Egghead.io. So if you're interested, definitely check them out. Give me some feedback. It's always nice to hear. And also, if you want to connect with me also after the conference, these are the places where I'm usually around. So definitely connect with me. It's always cool to meet new people. So we were talking about quality, right? What does it mean to have a good quality library? And I like to cite here the blog post which Minko Gechev wrote about a year ago, more or less. And he said, a good library should be platform independent. So what he meant with that is actually that it should not be too tightly coupled to the actual underlying DOM. Because for instance, in a web worker or an Angular Universal scenario, we actually don't have the DOM available. So it should be platform independent in that sense. Then it should obviously also be properly bundled and distributed so that people can easily consume it within their own apps. It should, of course, work with AOT, because that's somehow the default in Angular. And it should also play nice with TypeScript, because we want to have actually that out of completion and type, type checking support, which we have inside our app, also with third-party libraries. So our library basically should be able to be statically analyzable, so that tools can walk through it and reason about it. And it should be therefore also tree shakeable, and we should be able to basically avoid or apply such dead code elimination. And if you're interested in these kind of things, actually, Igor Minar gave a very interesting talk last year at the Reactive Conf, where he basically walked through different kind of steps for optimizing a simple application for the time to interactive. And there he explained it really, really good. So that's that. If we distribute our library like a minified UMD bundle, as you see here, it might actually not be the best case. So it might not be the best scenario which we can do. What does that mean in practice? So for, for my demo here today, I'm using a very simple application. It's actually here just having a tab component inside there. But it turns out that the tab component is actually quite good for being extracted out and be shared as a reusable library. And so if you, if you take a look at the source code, it's actually quite simple. So we have two components. We have a tab component, which is the single tab. And we have a tabs component, which is basically the container out of the whole tabs component. And so if you want to use that then in another application, we simply go there, we grab the tab, and we see how it should look like then. So it's quite easily consumable. Now the thing is, if you distribute the library with Angular nowadays, the ecosystem is quite huge. So basically, we actually don't really know whether our library is actually consumed by a simple script tag, whether it's being included by system.js, by Webpack, which is probably the most common scenario right now, as it powers the CLI. And it could also be read by Node.js for an Angular Universal scenario, or even the Clojure compiler rollup. And the point is, each of these tools have their strengths and weaknesses, and we should apply different kind of packaging for these tools in order they can work in the most optimal way. And so fortunately, we have actually the so-called Angular package format. So we don't have to invent that ourselves, but we rather can rely on something that Google already produced, and specifically the Angular team. And it's actually openly available on uh, a Google Doc, so you can just uh, Google it or use that link below. And you can read through it. It's actually quite easily readable. And it's basically a set of guidelines and well-tested practices. So the Angular team right now uses the same specification for distributing Angular itself, so they know whether that works or whether it doesn't work. And we can apply those rules on our own libraries as well. And that means basically that if we apply those rules, our package will seamlessly integrate into the Angular applications which are currently available online or which people are building. OK, so the overall goal is to support the tools which you have just seen, to optimize for the bundle size. That's a very important part here. But also to optimize for the build time. That's often a bit forgotten. But if you think that 
your application grows and grows and your build time slows down, it really drains the developer's productivity. So it's an important point to consider, actually. And one hard requirement of that is to have all in ESM, obviously, because ESM is like a prerequisite that tools can actually process those import statements and export statements and reason about the structure of our library. So if you take a look here, uh, these are the package formats actually that are currently exported by the so-called APF or Angular package format. You see in front that ESM, which is simply the ECMAScript module, then at the suffix here, we see basically which version is inside that package, so either ES6 or ES2015 or ES5. And then below we have the corresponding formats with that F in front. And that F stands for flat, so flat ECMAScript module. And the reason is because it turns out that distributing a large set of single ESM modules has actually some problems, some performance problems. And therefore the team decided to basically wrap them in. So basically we take all of these ESM modules and wrap them into a single file which is called a FASM module. Another thing that the, the package format standardizes is how the library should be structured when we distribute it. So that these are just, again, guidelines. It says, for instance, where the bundles should be, where the FASM5 libraries, uh, packages should be, where the FASM2015 package should be. Also how we include TypeScript and how we link them together. And finally, you might think, okay, but how does Rollup know which file to take or how does Node.js know which file to take? And there are actually some hints we have to place in our package JSON which then the tool will go and read. For instance, uh, Node.js will go in and read the main tag and then will be redirected to the proper UMD bundle. While, for instance, Closure Compiler will use the module format. Great, so it's all nice and easy, but how can I actually apply that to my own library? So how can we create that? Well, I gave a similar talk, actually with the same title, at NGB a couple of months back, and that was where I actually walked through the single steps. So how you ha can apply the different kind of tooling, to build that all yourself. And just to recap quickly, basically these are more or less the steps. So first of all, you usually have to inline the templates and the size of your component and something like that. Basically we transform the template URL and style CSS into the corresponding properties, but now inlined into our component. Then we obviously have to compile our TypeScript files down to JavaScript files because that's what's ultimately being executed. And so they will use NGC NGC is actually just a wrapper around the TypeScript compiler and it adds some further information which Angular itself needs, for instance, for a T compilation. And next, then, we use Rollup, for instance, right now to produce those FASM formats, so to merge those ESM modules into a single FASM module. And finally, also for UMD, Rollup can be used. It turns out it's quite nicely usable there. And we use Uglify for producing the minified bundle. And so, if you now do that all manually, you end up probably with a package JSON which has more or less this format, so you have the single instructions there, and basically you execute one after the other to produce the final output. So do we really have to do that all by hand? Well, not really. So luckily, there exists a project called ng-packager by David Herges, and it's actually a tool that automates that whole kind of stuff for yourself. So if you don't need that flexibility to do it all manually, then you can go for ng-packager. And so as you can see from the screenshot, we can simply install this as a development dependency over NPM. And then we have it in our project. And so let's quickly take a look at how that works. So for instance, here I have a simple project already set up. You can see here, these are the tabs components and the, the HTML file the corresponding ones and our tabs module. And what you have to do is basically just install ng-packager, which I have done already here. So I linked it as a dev dependency. And then what ng-packager actually wants is it wants this uh, ng-package key here. So you have to give it some configuration, some small hints, basically, so that, such that it knows where to get started. And actually, we here indicate that entry file, which is that public API TS file, which you can see down here. And it's actually containing simple references, export statements of what we want to export to the outside. So what should be visible to the people which consume my library. And then finally, you can simply, for convenience reason here, create a script tag inside the, uh, the npm package format, and then use ng-packager, pass it in that package JSON, so that it knows where to find basically the ng-package part here. And if you take a look at that, so if you run npm run build, we can see that ng-packager now starts up, it builds our package. It does also the whole inlining story, so which we have seen before. And what it produces then in the dist folder 
So you can see here there's this folder up there. It produces that nice bundle structure. So that's exactly what we have seen before in the screenshots. And now we could actually take this one and just distribute over the network. All right. So this is just a one side of the story, actually. Because if you want to develop a library, you usually have a kind of a workflow, right? So for instance, you usually develop in your preferred ID. Then you test it out. So you hopefully write unit tests against it with Karma, for instance. And then you also want to experiment with that library. So you want to have basically some workflow where you can see a demo application or something which uses your library and interactively develop your library in this way. And finally, if we then have our library ready to be shipped, we ship it over NPM or some other network. Great. So it turns out actually that the Norval and X extensions are quite nice for this kind of workflow. So Norval together with ng Packager for the final publishing. And Norval is actually just a set of schematics so that NGX workspace basically can be installed over NPM while that at Norval slash schematics. It powers on top of the CLI. So we have to have the CLI as well. And once we have installed those tools, we get then something called the Create NX Workspace. And the Create NX Workspace can then be used to generate such an NX workspace where we then can have inside there our library as well as our demo project. So how does that look actually? So let's take a look at that as well. So as you can see here, this is the workspace which NX generates for us. So it's actually thought for the monorepo scenario, so where you have basically multiple applications and multiple libraries inside there. And you can then just link those libraries from your applications without you need to actually distribute them or to package them. But we are actually focusing today on another kind of scenario where we actually cannot work with the monorepo, but we rather want to use that just, just for our development workflow and then publish our library out of that monorepo. So let's quickly take a look here at the demo application. Actually inside here, I have a very simple structure. You can see I'm loading in here my library. Okay. And here besides, you can see how it actually works. So we have our type component living inside there. So this actually works because there is a tsconfig file at the very root here, which says whatever is prefixed with this prefix, which I obviously defined here, should point to that libs folder. And indeed, if we go to that libs folder, we see our ngx tab slip inside there with exactly the same components which you have seen before. So I just copy and pasted them inside here. All right. Now, for instance, if we change something inside there, let's go into the tabs component here, just add some X here, refresh. You can see that we have that life cycle of automatic refreshing, so in that way we can develop our library. Now, once we are ready, we obviously want to distribute that library, right? So we want to take that one and then publish it to NPM, for instance. And we can do that in the very same manner. So as we mentioned before, we are using ng-packager. So I have installed that already here in that global package JSON, which is global for my whole workspace here. But I created here another package JSON just inside here, which serves just the purpose of distributing my library. So in fact, if you take a look here, we don't have any def, def dependencies, nor do we have dependencies actually, because that NPM, is, that package JSON is just used for the distribution purpose. But we have that same property inside here again. So we have again ng package, we have that lib folder, and we have specified that entry file. Furthermore, we specify here a directory where the output should actually be placed. Otherwise, it will place it just beneath here our source folders. Now, here, just a quick heads up. There's currently a CLI bug open, so which does not allow me, for instance, to do something like that. So I have to publish the library to the root of my workspace, because otherwise it wouldn't work. But I think that should be solved actually very quickly. Great. And then, again, for convenience reason, in my package JSON at the very top, of my workspace, I have here that build lib command in my scripts part. I again use ng-packager, and now I point obviously to that package JSON which resides in my lib folder. So again, we can simply stop this here and do an npm run build lib. It now does the same workflow which you have seen before, so it compiles. You can now see that we have at the very root here that folder with again the bundles inside there. And now the, the, the idea is also we want to test now this package library against our demo application. Because one thing is to consume the original library, but one is also we want to test whether the package one works as well. And we can actually do that because the Angular CLI here has a 
mechanism called multiple apps. And if you scroll down here a bit, you see that apps folder. And what we do here is we basically copy that app, that tabs demo app, which you have seen before. We create something called tabs demo packaged for the simple reason that we want to change here the TS config. And we will see immediately why. Well, this TS config currently resides inside here. So we just copy the original one. We point here to a TS config packaged, which again resides at the very root here. So we're slowly arriving. And finally, we need to override this key. So we inherit from the original TS config, but we override this key here and tell it basically now take not the one from the lib folder, but which we just produced, so in the distributed package version. Now again, I created here something called npm run packaged. Let me just look that up. Okay, npm run start packaged. Now if you ex execute that, it will now take my lib from the disk folder. So the CLI compiles it behind the scenes. Again, if I do a refresh here, it still works. I can even go into the libs folder and I know that it reads the ESM5 format right now. And let's go inside here and do some keys inside. And you see it even refreshes and now puts them online here. So we know it serves the package version and we also know it works. And finally, we also spoke about tests, right? So that's actually a very easy part to add here because I simply added here a test case here below, so a spec file with some test cases inside there. And since NX is basically based on top of the CLI, it is already set up for us, so I just simply can run npm test. It will now execute Karma, just as the normal Angular CLI does. Obviously, it has to compile first. And now you can see that it executes the tests. There are five tests right now, and they all work. So also, the testing scenario is basically covered very nicely. All right. So let's look a bit ahead. What is coming along the road in the next couple of weeks or next months? So I would like to highlight one project in particular, which is called the ABC project, which is a labs project within the Angular team. And it's uh, now called Angular Build Tools Convergence. And these labs projects are basically projects where the Angular team experiments with new things, which are going to be released very soon, but they're not yet production ready. So they might be missing some documentation. There might be some edge case which don't work yet. And that ABC stands f uh, specifically also for Bazel. Like Matthias today morning in the keynote mentioned Bazel, that is going to be probably one option in the future to use for your Angular applications. And the, the point is that Bazel is actually highly adaptable and composable. So it's like Unix pipes, which you can link together, and they can use the results of the predecessor and so on. It is very well tested for high scalability because they actually use it inside Google. And because of uh, specific properties of Bazel, they can even do remote execution or parallelization of those tasks. So you could basically send the build process out in the cloud and get the results back to your own project. It's also very optimized for speed, because inside the Google you have actually the SLA that the meantime basically of the compilation, so when you do an edit, then compile and refresh in the browser, should be at two seconds, constant, so independent of how large your application grows, actually. And the large last part here is the support. So right now, the Google team or the Angular team has to support basically the customer inside Google, which use Bazel mainly, and the open source community outside, which currently use the Angular CLI with Webpack. And obviously, if they can bring those tools more together, they can focus on providing more features on them. So their support would actually decrease. All right, so if you want to test out Bazel, there's actually a site, build.bazel, so you can install it on your machine and experiment with it. And so let's take a look at how that would work. It's actually currently a very work in progress. So if you take a look here, you can see the different kind of Bazel files. So first of all, we have here a so-called workspace, which defines basically the project root of such a Bazel project. And there you define things like the name. And then you import the different kind of tools Bazel needs in order to compile your workspace. So these are a bunch of rules. As you can see right now, they're even targeting specific commits because, as mentioned, it's a work in progress, and set up different kind of tools. So basically, for the Angular project compilation, also some RxJS references inside here. The more interesting part, then, is in that build Bazel. 
because that's actually what defines the build project, the build process of our project here, of our library project. And here we can do things like, okay, define here the TS config which we have at the root and expose it to all subsequent Bazel rules so they can just directly reference it without having to point to specific paths. We also expose the node modules obviously because we won't need that. And then we bring in these kind of rules here. So ng module, which defines our normal Angular module, so that unit there, and the ng package, which is what we are actually interested in today. And that ng package will actually be then responsible for building our library, which again is distributable over npm. If you go inside there in the source folder, because actually here we have to find an ng module rule, basically a Bazel rule, which says, okay, I have a dependency on that source folder, and you can tell that because Inside there we have a Bazel rule again, a Bazel build file, which then defines how the compilation works inside that source folder. And so just to give you a brief overview of that as well, I have again added here that Bazel build lib. And so if I run here, let me make this a bit bigger, npm run build lib, Bazel will actually start and compile this, and has produced already our output. And if I now like highlight this directory here. Let me just grab it properly. Okay, so can you now see here again we have that bundles, that DSM 2015, and the DSM file inside there. As mentioned, this is still a very work in progress because it works. You can actually use that bundle which we have just produced and use that within another library project. But there are some limitations still, like inlining of templates doesn't, that doesn't yet work, but the team is currently working on this right now, actually. Okay, what else might come up? Angular CLI support, we heard something about in the keynote today. It's not sure whether it is made for v6 or in the future, but there's already some signs that it is very near, actually, because there's something called a build architect, which will allow basically to hook in other build tools into the Angular CLI. And this pull request is actually from last week, where David Herges, which is the creator of ng Packager, works together with the Angular team to integrating ng Packager into the Angular CLI. So maybe in the future we would have basically some instructions to directly create that library out of the Angular CLI. Then what about publishing? Because we actually didn't talk about publishing yet. So what's about that story? Actually, it's quite simple to be honest, because once you have created your bundle, then we could actually just take that this folder entering that at this folder, you obviously have to adjust your package JSON version number, and then you can do an npm publish, and it will also finish on npm, for instance. So it would just work. My suggestion is always to automate as much as possible. So try to automate the versioning, try to automate the deployment. There are actually some good hints you can do. For instance, use conventional, conventional commit messages. These are basically a way for standardizing your commit messages. So you have a type in front, you have a scope, and then some description, and even a more detailed body. And so it could look like something like that. So you have like some changes for docs, some fixes, or some features you're releasing. And you can have actually define your own types. You can also have types, for instance, like for CI, for uh, the build steps, or some performance improvements, refactoring, whatever you actually need in your team. And then you can use tools such as standard version and convention and uh, semantic release which can then process those commit messages and reason about them. So they can determine your next semantic version. They can even deploy it automatically to NPM. They can also they generate your change log out of that semantic commit messages. And then you can use tools such as Travis CI or Circle CI, or even if you have uh, some own integration services like GitLab or on Azure there are services as well, or Bitbucket pipelines. Just automate this stuff because it will take away a lot of work from you. Great, then some final considerations and uh, wrap up. First of all, take a look at what's coming up with the Angular package format, because actually the team is right now probably working on a new version of it. It will basically be an evolved version of the v5 version. And there might be some changes on how packages are being distributed. So for instance, there might be some just FASM format and also ESM format files, which are distributed because of different kinds of reasons, because it turns out that FASM which you have just seen today, is really performant for doing the tree shaking mechanism, but it's not that optimal if you want to do code splitting. And so they're currently doing some performance measurements exactly on this kind of stuff in order to decide what they will use next. 
Then if you define your library or distribute your library, always think about how much you package into one single ng module. So if you have, for instance, a UI library, don't package everything into one single module because then you force people actually to use the whole package or nothing. Uh, but rather connect the smallest set of the code which is connected between it. So good examples, for instance, are the NGX Bootstrap project or also the Angular Material project because they have similar problems. And so you can directly take a look at their examples and see how they build it. Then we have seen you should basically distribute a library that is AOT friendly, TypeScript friendly, of course. You should optimize for those different kind of tooling which we have seen, and you should stick to that package format. But to be honest, if you use tools, for instance, such as NG Packager, you are actually on a safe side because next time the Angular package format, for instance, upgrades and you get a new upgrade also from NG Packager, you will automatically get also those new changes. So we are quite on a safe side from that point of view. Also use semantic versioning because that's actually the best thing you can do when you distribute, for instance, over NPM. And write tests and automate. Now, I have all of this code is uh, on GitHub. So you can go to that repository. There are different kind of branches. So in the master branch, there is the NG Packager setup. If you want the fully blown setup, there is also a manual setup there, which I gave in my last talk. Then there's the demo project setup with an X workspace, which you have seen, and the basic product setup, which is still a work in progress. So there's still being pull requests merged into that. I also just published an, a video on ACAD just before this talk here. It's really available, so you can check it out at least for the next three or four days, I think. And it actually shows how you can take an existing Angular module and pull it out basically into a distributable module using ng Packager, and it's like four and a half minutes or something, so it's quite quick to watch. I would like to thank Jason Aiden and Alex Eagle from the Google Core team. Especially Alex Eagle provided me a lot of support with the Bazel setup because there isn't actually a lot of documentation around. He even provided another pull request today morning. I wasn't able to merge it in yet, so I will do that afterwards. And if you have any questions, obviously, connect with me afterwards. Write me on Twitter or come to my office hours. Thank you. <laughs>